So when I was a young man, uh, I joined the United States Army in 1997, actually March 26th. So I'm coming up on my, I don't know, it would be my 25th anniversary. I retired right at 20 years. So um, I spent a lot of time in the military. And, you know, when I was, well, probably all the way up until the last five years, I, I thought I was a good soldier. I thought I knew the military and I was a jealous, resentful person. I was in a military band, a National Guard band, and I had a, well, I don't, I didn't have, I have, right, I didn't have, I currently hold, excuse me, a master's in music performance. And my resume, my musical resume is pretty, it's pretty awesome. You wouldn't know it now because I don't really play like I used to, but that was my career once upon a time. And so here I am in this army band with rank and men and and, and ambition, right, and lots of pride and peacock feathering by everybody. And I found myself being very resentful of those around me that were promoted before me to higher ranks than I was. I found myself often thinking, man, I've been in this unit for 12 years, and that joker over there has only been here for five. I've got a master's degree. He doesn't even have a degree. How did he get promoted before me? Or that guy right there, He got promoted and I can play circles around him. I kept making value judgments, right? Like, I'm better than that person. How dare they get promoted over me? In my mind, I thought that because of the time that I had spent in the military and the qualifications that I had, I deserved more than that person that got what I wanted over there. What we're going to learn today, though, is that way of looking at the world, which we're all susceptible to, it's not the way Jesus operates in his kingdom. The kingdom of God doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, there's no rank, seniority, pay scale, or even levels of achievement in the kingdom of God. There's not. Jesus saves and rewards all who believe in him equally and without distinction. Know that today. You don't have to worry about your status, how much you know, how much you don't know. Those things are meaningless. All that matters is that God has grace and he displays it through his son, Christ, and he will give each one of you the same reward regardless of your background, regardless of what you've done or you didn't do. And that's good news. And so when I was in the army, what I was really doing was looking at that situation with a worldly lost framework. Now, as a Christian, I look back on that time and I'm very embarrassed, but I'm grateful and I'm happy because I now know what real rank, seniority, and achievement means. Here's what it means. Doing what nobody else is willing to do. It means putting myself below those that at one time I tried to put myself above. So there is no rank, no seniority, no pay scale. There is only believers united in Christ. So as we look in our scripture, we remember that last week uh, we heard the story of the rich young ruler. As Jesus is walking, this man comes up to him. Uh, He's a learned man, probably a lay leader in in the synagogue. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? Or what must I do to be saved? And Jesus tells him kind of like the stock answer. He says, hey, man, I've done all those things. And Jesus took a scalpel to his heart and said, well, that's great. You're almost perfect. Now go do this. And of course, we remember from last week, he was unwilling to let go of the things that made him who he thought was his identity, right? His possessions and his wealth. And he went away grieving. And then after that, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, uh, it's, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. As a matter of fact, he says, I tell you, it will be hard, so hard that it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle. And then when the disciples heard this, they were astonished and asked, then who can be saved, right? Because remember, the the common perception of the time was if you are a Jewish person in God's chosen people and you look holy, you do all the religious things, you wear the right clothes and you're wealthy and you look and have all this stuff, well, clearly God must be blessing you. You must be closer to God. (laughs) So these poor disciples who were fishermen and 
traitors to the Jewish nation, you know, tax collectors and all of these other things. They're like, well, well, man, if, if that guy over there who looks really close to God, if he can't be saved, then who can be? And that's when Jesus says, well, with man, it's impossible. There's nothing a man can do to be saved. But with God, all things are possible. God can save anybody he wants. And he's chosen to do that by sending his son, who is God made flesh, who lived a perfect life, never did anything wrong, died in a point of death, was buried in a real grave, rose from the dead, and after 40 days ascended into heaven where he is seated right now at the right hand of the Father. So that brings us to today's passage. So if we look at verse 26, excuse me, I'm in the wrong spot. It is verse 26, but on this page, not this page. Uh, it's verse 27, excuse me. So Jesus says that with God, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then Peter responds. And here's what he says. Peter responded to him. See, we have left everything and followed you. So what will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you in the renewal of all things, when the son of man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now our text continues through uh, verse 16 of chapter 20 and we'll get there, but let's, let's camp out here for a second and talk about this interaction. See, what he's saying is that when you give up your life to follow Jesus, your loss is actually gain. That's what Jesus is teaching them. Peter asked them, look, we've left everything. We, we left our families. We left our fishing career. We've left our, you know, our fields. If they were farmers, we, we gave it all up. We can't get it back. You know, people think we're nuts. We just dropped our nets and went after you. So if that guy can't be saved and you say only God can save peace people, are we going to be saved? Can you kind of sense like his, his heart attitude and his fear? I think some people wrongly look at this and think he's kind of being bold and prideful. You know, well, what about us? Look what we've done. I don't know that that's his heart motive. I mean, I'm not sure. It doesn't say. But if I'm Peter and I know Peter and so do you, he's heart on the sleeve guy foot and mouth guy, right? But, but he says what he, what he thinks and, and he's very vulnerable and he's very transparent. I think it's this sweet, innocent insecurity in Peter. I think he's speaking for the 12. I think that he's saying what everybody's thinking. And I think we think that too when we read that verse before, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Okay, well, will God make it possible for me to be saved, right? That's the, that's the natural question. If we love God and we are pursuing Christ, then we want to know, are we going to be saved? Maybe Peter is thinking, is God going to make it possible for me? Maybe he's thinking, I have nothing left. What's next if it's not possible for me to be saved? And see, this is so true for Christians today. Like you've been a believer for five minutes, five hours, five weeks, five years. Don't we get plagued very frequently with thoughts of unworthiness? Have you, have you experienced that, Christian? <laughs> like, man, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just not worthy to be a Christian. I mean, I know I'm dealing with it right now. God is blessing this church right now in a myriad of ways. Financially, people resources, worshipers, interactions in the community. Our, our local community right here is waking up that this church is a place where Jesus is glorified where it has been looked at negatively since the Methodist church sold it to them evil Southern Baptists some 20 years ago, right? I mean, God is doing great work here in uh, Hawanda. No, Hornbrook and in Tawanda. We could make a big town called Hawanda, but it would be even weirder than Tawanda, right? Um, But God is doing all of these things. And I find myself and my family, you know, over there, we're we're feeling God's blessing, um, not because of what he's doing for us. We're not getting rich and we're not... You know, we're not getting things, but we're getting to see in real life and in living color, God working miraculous things. And then I feel sometimes like, man, I'm just not worthy. How, how could this be happening? And then I start thinking to myself, like, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe God's going to take this away from me. Right. And I start to think in sort of a quid pro quo relationship. 
And then I start thinking, well, man, you know, maybe I don't believe enough. Like, and I think you guys feel that way too sometimes. Like, do I really believe? One of my favorite verses is in the gospel of Mark when the man, you know, when Jesus says to the man, well, you know, do you believe? And he says, yes, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I mean, that's my battle cry, right? Other people's battle cry is like, I'm going to go get them. Never quit, never die. I'm like, I believe, help my unbelief, right? That's my battle cry. Maybe we're not smart enough. I mean, I know a lot of people that think, well, you know, I just don't know enough to be a good Christian. I don't know all those verses in the Bible. I don't, you know, uh, we're, we're discipling a person right now that, that doesn't know they're saved. And, and I'm not God, but, but I would bet if I could ask God and he would give me a straight answer, I think this person is saved. Some of you know who I'm talking about and, and they're just like, well, I just, I want to believe, but I just don't know that I know enough yet. The disciples were, were, were thinking all of this. Well, how is it possible? But here's what God is saying when he says, for God, all things are possible. It means that God's grace and his mercy is bigger than any shortcoming that you have. It's bigger. And, and here's a Chuck Frickerism. Ready? That's me if you didn't know. Here's a Chuck Frickerism. And Samuel said not to remember this. He prayed that. So I hope God lets you remember this. If you are thinking to yourself, I'm not worthy enough. I don't know enough. I don't do enough good. And you're worried because you're like, is it possible for God to save me? Chances are you're saved because lost people don't care. Right? Lost people don't care. If I'm not pleasing God and I don't believe in God, you know who I want to please? I'm pleasing me. Where am I getting my next piece of pleasure? Where am I getting my next attaboy from some group of think, people that, you know, that I really care about? And so the disciples are no different than us, right? They're thinking the same thing. What are we going to get? Did we do enough? Are you going to save us? But God's grace is bigger than all that. See, Jesus says this, to enter the kingdom of God, you have to do one thing. And they go together. It's two words, but it's really one thing. Ready? Repent and believe. That's all he says. He doesn't say, go get clean first and come to my kingdom. He doesn't say, go learn some things or do some good works. He says, hate your sin and love God and believe that Jesus can do what you couldn't do. That's it. The kingdom of God is about trusting that Jesus has and did everything that you lack and didn't do. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's upside down. It's not logical in terms of a human mindset That isn't in Christ. We can't really get that. But then the interaction continues. In verse 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now notice this. This is one of the few times that Jesus graciously answers their question directly and about them, right? Most of the time in the Gospels when the disciples have a misunderstanding or they ask Jesus a question, he definitely answers, but it's vague and in broad strokes, right? Or you don't know, is he answering the disciples? Or is he saying it to you in the pew? Or is he saying it to some group in the 2,000 year history? It's just, it, it applies to like a whole universal group of things. But in this particular case, he addresses them directly. He has compassion on their heart motive. He knows that they love him. He knows that they've sacrificed everything. And he chose them anyway. So of course he's going to make it possible, right? And he says this. He says, in the renewal of all things. Well, what is that? Well, if you ever read the book of Revelation and you turn, you don't need to do it now. But if you turn to chapter 21, the first uh, several verses... Uh, talk about the renewal of all things. Let me read some of that to you. This is what Jesus is pointing forward to. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them, They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Amen. That's the renewal of all things. For us, that's our great hope. Yes, I want to be with Jesus. And if that happens, 
in the next couple of minutes or the next couple of days, then, then I'm going to spend eternity starting them with the Lord. But really what we're looking for is when God lives with humankind and sin is done away with forever and everything is gone. So then he says in that moment, that renewal of all things, when the son of man is on his glorious throne with mankind in perfect communion, he says, you who have followed me. And he's specifically talking to the uh, 11 disciples or the 12 disciples. He's saying this. He's saying, you will sit on special thrones that I'm making for you to judge the nation of Israel. Now, to judge does not mean execute a punishment or a reward. The word judge comes from the Bible and the biblical meaning, the Old Testament meaning, which Jesus is referring to is to govern. So think of a governor. That's what a judge is. So what he's saying is you have sacrificed all of these things and you will have these honorary positions to govern the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. (laughs) But that comes with a cost, right? So these are the first followers of Christ. These are the first ones that Jesus went out and brought to his earthly ministry. And while their reward will be different than ours, not greater, but different. They're not going to get it until the renewal of all things, which is at the end of the age, right? So they were first, but then when do they get their ultimate fulfillment? Last, right? Last. In verse 29, it says, and everyone, so Jesus continues talking, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. He says, all who, has, who have done what you have done. So now Christ turns from talking to the 12 in real time, that's his audience, to talking to us here today. All, anybody, all, let, hey, I'm stealing this because I like this, ready? So I, one of my favorite preachers said this the other day, I'm going to steal it from him. Sorry, Brian McKenzie, I'm taking it, right? All right, so here's some high-level academics. You ready? All in Greek. Do you know what it really means in Greek? It means all. All means all in Greek. And it all means us. So that doesn't just mean all the people in Jesus' time. It doesn't mean all the people today. It means everyone who ever followed Christ and left their old life behind. All of them will receive what? A hundred times more and eternal life. So whatever you leave, this is God's promise to you. Whatever you leave for the name of Jesus, as valuable as that was, as great as it was, what you get is a hundred times better. And that's probably an underestimate. And for no extra cost, if you buy that, you'll get eternal life. What a great deal. What a great deal. The family, the mother, the children, it's not a literal thing saying that you have to, if you have lost people in your home, I know you know this, but let me just be clear. It doesn't mean, you know, like, like I have family members that are lost. I'm not going to like turn my back on them, right? And never talk to them and never help them out. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that the things that are the most valuable to you, and what is that? Our families, right? Our families and our land, our homes. So Jesus is using that to say that and everything else, Right? So, of course, if you're going to leave your family for Jesus, you definitely would leave your Porsche. I hope. Right. I hope. (laughs) I hope your Porsche is less valuable than your mother, brother, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, whatever. So it really is Jesus saying, leaving everything that means so much to you. Now, here's the thing, though. This is not something that we do. To earn God's favor. It's not like you can today say, I'm going to leave all that stuff behind so then God will owe me that hundred times more in that eternal life. If you are a believer in Christ, if you truly follow him, then you will do it willingly and joyfully and almost involuntarily. Why? Because when you're a believer, the wealth and belongings that you have are no longer important to you. They're just not. They're just not. If you're a believer, you're lost family and friends. You're not going to leave them because you're, you're somehow self-righteous. Here's what will happen. They reject your kingdom values because they're blind spiritually. And they will force you to leave them in certain cases. 
your careers, colleagues, and social standings. You know that the world has values and ethics that are at odds with Jesus' values and ethics. I spoke about it in my little corny story about my military experience, right? So what I'm trying to do here is paint a picture to tell you you're not going to have to grin and bear it and kind of like, oh, I've got to leave this behind. It's going to happen naturally because the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And what you value is Jesus and you're just going to keep running to him. And it's like they can't keep up. And you're going to keep calling back to them. Hey, family, friends, come, follow me. But when you have to choose, do I stay behind for my family and the things that I used to value? Or do I keep running and try and not try, but he's keeping us right. He's, we're drafting behind Jesus. He's sucking us along with him, right? When I'm doing that, this is so much better that even though this is sad and I have compassion and sorrow at times for people, not for the things. It's like, this is so much better. I want this. And that's what I want for you today. I want you to want Jesus more than anything else. I want me to want Jesus more than anything else. Because even as saved sinners, we sometimes think we want other things. And we're all susceptible to that. So these disciples were the first to know Jesus, right? And they're going to be the last to receive this hundred times more heavenly reward. Thus illustrating... The first will be last and the last will be first. You see, what Jesus is saying is really a summary that says it's true faith in him that means we no longer want those things. And the reason is that a born again believer in Christ, we value different things. The spirit changes our hearts and minds to value Jesus over all. He becomes our everything. And this is not a case of self-sacrifice that causes resentment or longing. To the contrary, this is a joyful willingness to let go of the things that could never truly fulfill you or save you in the first place. And there it is. Only Christ can fulfill your purpose and save you. Only Christ can give you true wealth and true meaning. Only Christ can let you live your best life. And it's not about now, it's about eternity, isn't it? If I live my best life now, I've got a long eternity of disappointment. But if I can live my best life through eternity, I'll trade my now any day for that. Any day. And so then we move on to uh, chapter 20. Now, some, well, not some, all Bibles split the chapter here, right? We just finished chapter 19. We get into 20. And most of your Bibles have a heading and it says something like parable of the vineyard workers. This is a very bad chapter break. Because this parable is directly connected to what we just talked about. Jesus gives the disciples an answer to the question. He teaches them about eternal things and and immediate things. And this parable, unlike other parables, is not being said to a crowd, is it? This is a unique parable. It's being said to the disciples alone. To illustrate, to teach them what he means by the answer he just gave them. So let me read, if you can follow along in your Bibles, I'm in chapter 20. I'm going to read the first 16 verses. Jesus says this, he says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, which by the way, let me just tell you right now, that was a coin and it was one day's wage for a Roman soldier. You could buy enough food for one day with a denarius. He sent them into his vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same things. Then about five, he went and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one hired us, they said to him. You also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, sorry, excuse me, when those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. When they received it, they began to complain to the landowner. These last men put in one hour of work and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. Jesus or the landowner replied to them, friend, I'm not doing you 
any wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. So Jesus gives this parable. And in the beginning, what we see is that Jesus seeks and saves sinners with generosity, grace, and mercy. Jesus does that. So who is this cast of characters in the first two verses? We know that a parable is not a true story. It means a very specific thing. It's meant, designed, and composed by Jesus to teach a lesson. So we have a landowner. We need to know that that represents the Lord. The landowner is the Lord. The vineyard is the kingdom of heaven. A denarius is the reward of eternal life that all believers get. And the workers are us. It's believers. And the time is kind of like the history of all of salvation, but also, uh, you know, in a church like young believers and all believers, it means all of those things. Time is a, is, a, is, a, is a way to express this idea of I've done more or I've done longer and you've done less. And so if we understand those things, then we can really mine this parable for all it's worth. In verses 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, you hear a story about how Jesus, well, first he goes out and he gets the first group. And he says, and this is 6 a.m., by the way, this would have been when the workday started. He says, come work for me, I'll give you the reward, which is a denarius, right? Eternal life. But then he goes out again at 9 a.m. And then he goes at noon and he goes at 3 p.m. So every three hours. And he continues to find people in this marketplace waiting to be hired as a day laborer. Uh, and that would have been common. And then finally he goes when probably no other landowners would go out at 5 p.m. That's an hour before sunset. 6 p.m. was considered the end of the workday. So they pulled 12 hour shifts. Right. And so that's that's kind of crazy. Right. I'm going to go out and for one hour, I'm going to get more workers to come into my fields. And so Jesus seeks and call and, and calls these people. So remember, the landowner is the Lord, but it's also meant to show our lives today. When you were saved, let me ask you a question. Did you one day say, I need to go find this person, Jesus, and, and enter his kingdom? Or did you hear the gospel, realize your need for the Lord and you believed? It's the first thing. And if it's not that way, then that's contradicting scripture, right? So Jesus seeks out people like the landowner. He didn't wait for workers to come to him. The landowner went out into the marketplace and he sought after people that were not employed. And he went out when he probably didn't have to, even for the last hour of the day. For us, Jesus welcomes us into his kingdom at the perfect time when we needed it, didn't he? Imagine these workers. Why weren't the workers at 9 and 3 and 12 and 5? Why weren't they there in the morning? Well, I don't know. Maybe they, re- they didn't know they needed it, right? And all of a sudden, you know, who knows? I mean, it's a fake story. The point is this. They were there because they needed a job. And the landowner sought them out when they needed it most, and he provided what they needed. That's what Jesus does for us. And what Jesus tells these first workers it's, it's like a contract. What do we think of a contract? It's a, it's a covenant, right? What's the covenant that we have in Christ? His blood pays for the sins of those who put faith in him. And so when we go to heaven, we can do that because his perfect blood clothes us in righteousness. And we can be in the throne room with a holy God and all of those things. But what happens here is that when we follow him... The gremlins every, every Sunday. Hold on. It'll, I touched the wire. That's what it was. When we follow him, when we follow Jesus, we can sometimes fool ourselves into thinking we can earn a little bit more grace, can't we? We can earn a little bit more favor. Well, if I'm a Christian and I, you know, I do really, really, really good, maybe I'll have a little more heaven than the next guy, you know? Man, I'm not going to be a real Christian unless I'm a deacon and I'm a this and a that. Or, you know, I... <laughs> I've been in this church for 30 years. You're not going to move anything unless I give my stamp of approval because I'm a holy old saint and Jesus has a special room for me. Well, he's got a special room for all of us, but none are better than any other, right? And that's good news. So Jesus goes out, he calls sinners. And listen, here's what's unique about these workers. They have to trust that the landowner 
is trustworthy enough to give them what is right. Isn't that what the landowner says? I'm going to give you what is right. So he tells the first workers, but then the other ones, he just says, I'm going to give you what's right. They have to trust that he's going to do it. So there's the relationship between our salvation and Christ, right? We have to trust Christ that he did all that needed to be done to give us forgiveness of our sins. See, what we need to realize is that the Lord's vineyard is always better than the marketplace of the world. We need to trust that Jesus provides a kingdom that gives us more, sustains us better than what the world offers. Now, when I look at the 5 p.m. workers that come out for one hour, I think of Jesus when he said in the gospel, look at these people. He had compassion on them. He said they're sheep without a shepherd. That's what I think of of these 5 p.m. folks. And what does he say about them, the, the owner? What does he say about these last ones? He says they were doing nothing. He actually says that about the other three groups, too. They're lost. They're aimless. They're hopeless. They have no purpose. It's like they're loitering in life. Wasn't that us outside of Christ? We thought we had a path. We thought we had a good good thing going. I'm going to be this. I'm going to do that. I need to get this. I need to get that or do these things. But if we're honest on this side of salvation, we look back and we're like, we were loitering through life. We were just hanging out with no real purpose, no real objective, and it was going nowhere. Fast. It's never too late. It's never too late. No one is ever too far gone to receive the grace that we talked about in our chapter 19 verses a few minutes ago. It's never too late. God's invitation to the vineyard never expires until the renewal of all things. That would be 6 p.m., right? Sun goes down. You can't work in a vineyard. Can you see? Nope. I ain't got no flashlight back then in first century Judea. 6 p.m. is coming, ladies and gentlemen. So what do we do? Do we, do we give up proclaiming the gospel to somebody who we've talked to over and over again and they, and they reject it? No, we keep doing it. I'll never forget being a new Christian in my first church and having a, a guest preacher say, I got called at the last minute because your pastor has a great friend who doesn't know Jesus and he has hours to live and he flew there to share the gospel with that man in a final hope. That man, I don't know that he got saved or not. We never, I don't know that I remember it was ever said. But if he did, if he accepted Christ as his savior, he will get the same reward as the five-year-old kid who accepts Christ and lives to a ripe old age of 95 and dies. And Jesus says to him, good job, well done, good and faithful servant. They both get the same reward. The thieves on the cross to uh, to either side of Jesus. One mocks him, the other one says, don't forget me. And Jesus turns and says, I got something for you, buddy. Right? Doesn't he say that? That guy was a sinner and he was dying right at the same time as Jesus. It wasn't too late for him. It's not too late for you. We put our faith in Jesus, not because of what he gives us. The workers, I think, if you, if you talk to them, like the, especially these folks at 5 p.m. and the ones that went you know, at 9 and 12, they didn't really go for the pay. I mean, they did, but I think they respected the landowner more. And for us, that's why we would go. We go because he's God. We go because Jesus is God. As a Christian, we know that the reward, even of eternal life, is secondary to who he is. And I want you to think about that for a second. Our reward is not eternal life. It's not the many blessings. Our reward is being near and in perfect relationship with the Son of God. That's our treasure. He's our treasure. The other stuff is icing on the cake. I like cake without icing. It's a little better with icing. But if I had no cake and all icing, I'd throw up. I want Jesus and then everything else. And that works here. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and all things will be added to you. That's saying put Jesus in your front view and everything else will come. But then we learn in the next verses that if we look at this um, the wrong way, we'll come face to face with this, this truth. As a human, we earn wrath, but we receive grace. In verse 8, it says, when evening came... The owner, the landowner of the vineyard, told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. 
So when the first ones came, they assumed they would get more, but they also received a denarius each. Now, we just said that it's never too late to run to Jesus because mercy and grace, his mercy and grace is lavished on all who comes to him regardless of when it is. The point is that we just come. That's what I want you to hear. It wasn't that the 5 p.m. workers came and did some amazing job in the vineyard. By the time they got warmed up, the day was done. Here's what they did to earn that denarius. They just came. You just come to Christ and Christ does all the stuff. And really, he came to you and you just were like, I agree that you're awesome, Jesus, right? Just come to him. Come to the altar. That's a great song. We need to do that here one day. You receive the full reward with no pro, uh, excuse me, no partiality, no proration or special bonuses. Everyone gets a full reward. It's not how long, or how hard you work or how perfectly you follow Jesus. It's just that you do. It's just that you do. Following Jesus is not a straight line for most of us. Following Jesus is like this. He's walking ahead because he's God and sovereign and knows all things and he... He goes in a straight line. And this is us behind him. And we hope we're making some forward progress. And when we get too far afield, like the one sheep of 99, he kind of comes over and puts his arm around us. Let's go back. Right? That's what following Jesus looks like. It's not about your perfection. It's about your love of the Savior. It's about your devotion to Him. It's about the trust that you know whatever... Uh, deficiency you have, whatever sin in your heart, Christ is working in you right now to complete that work and to sanctify you and make you like him. When they received the wage, the first workers, they began to complain to the landowner. They said, these last men put in one hour and you made them equal to us who bore the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. But what we see is that Jesus saves sinners the same, all of us. They're worried about what's fair and what's not. And, and this makes sense. If we look at the situation with human eyes, right, worldly eyes, yeah, well, you agreed with me for one denarius. So when I saw that guy at 5 p.m. that came, he got one, I'm thinking I'm going to get more, right? Well, if he got what I agreed to, it's going to get good, come on. But I got the same, right? That, that's what he's thinking. But here's the thing, if we get what's fair, and, and, and that's a human thought, right? God's being unjust. He's not giving the first workers more than the end. And all of these things, we miss the boat. And here's the boat. If we got what was fair, the workers in the story and us would get eternal damnation. That's what's fair. Remember, we earn wrath, but we receive grace. There's only one thing you can earn, and that's God's judgment. That's it. What does the Bible say? The wages of sin are death. But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life. A free gift, unmerited favor, is grace. I want grace because if I get what's fair, I'm not going to be a happy camper and neither are you. And it's a misunderstanding. These first workers represent believers. And we can look at this uh, in, in, our, in our modern church right here, right? New believer comes to Christ. They're on fire for the Lord. There's nothing better than a baby believer Christian. And you're kind of like, yeah, you'll figure it out, buddy. Yeah, it's not all roses and peaches. Oh, sure, you're telling everybody about Jesus. But once you get rejected a few times, you know, really what you need to do is prop me up because I've been in this church forever. You better serve me. Make me some coffee. Make me some potluck. We'll be all good, right? But the reality is, if we look at this with God's eyes... Not human structures of authority and reward, then we would be celebrating those things. What the kingdom, or in this parable, what those first workers should have done is rejoiced that the workers at 5 p.m. got the same as them. Because what it's doing is it's showing who God really is. He is gracious and merciful, perfectly loving. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. And how amazing is it that he's going to give the last person the same as the first and the first person the same as the last? None of them deserve any of it. They don't deserve any. And yet God gives it all the same. 
If we earned more grace, if there was a structure where, you know, I'm a better Christian than you. And when we go to heaven, you know, I'm going to get more than you or whatever. Right. If that's true, then it nullifies grace because that means I can earn more. Well, the first little bit of grace you get, Christian, that's free and that's for me. But after that, if you want to get even more, and then at what point do you, do you receive so much from God that, that, that it's just ridiculous, right? Grace is grace is grace is grace. You can't earn it. You can't get more of it. You only get what God gives you because only he can give it. We need to understand that. That's important. Here's a great quote. This is from Craig Blomberg. Um, that's a funny name. <laughs> Uh, He writes lots of Christian uh, academic literature. This is from one of my seminary books, and I've always loved this quote. He says this, no one gets less than he was promised. Many get much more than they deserve in the kingdom of heaven. Let me read that one more time. No one gets less than he was promised. Many get much more than they deserve. Verse 13 says, he replied to them or to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on a denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give this last man the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with this, which is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? Jealousy and Jesus don't mix. Put that on a t-shirt. Jealousy and Jesus don't mix. There is no seniority in heaven. There's only faithfulness and loving devotion to the Lord. That's it. We need to rejoice with those who are given this amazing grace. We are all called at different times and for different purposes. We have different gifts and talents and God's going to give us different amounts of treasure and all of these things. It doesn't make us better or worse. It doesn't mean I'm blessed more and you're not or vice versa. What it means is God has a perfect plan that he's sovereignly working out. And really all you should want is Jesus. All those other things are tools so you can accomplish the works that he's already planned for you because he has saved you. Do you understand? Like that's important. So don't get wrapped up in that. We need to show joy when people labor for the kingdom. Our joy is to labor. We're brought into the vineyard whether we have an hour or the rest of the 12 hour day. I'm excited to sweat for Jesus. You know why? Because that means I'm sharing the gospel. That means I'm following Christ's commands as much as he is allowing me to in my imperfection. It means that I am trying to show the love of Christ. We learned in Sunday school today, Jesus said at the Last Supper, he said, love others as I have loved you. He said, this is a new commandment. That's our labor. Love one another. That's what I want to do. So when we see a Christian that, that somehow, like maybe their ministry is bigger, right? Well, look at that guy, man. He's just so talented and he's out there and all this. And if that's not what you're doing, it doesn't mean you're less. It means God has something different for you. I think God, based on this this scripture this morning, the last first, the first last, I think he has a special heart for the people that are not known in ministry. I think he has a special heart for the people that nobody knows. Maybe that 80-year-old woman that has faithfully showed up to church her entire life, loves Jesus, never taught a Sunday school class. Never been honored, but she just loves Jesus and is quietly generous, quietly serves. She's the one that picks up the trash that nobody noticed was there. That's the last. The first are the ones that get so excited, they're just out front. So I think I'm going to be one of those first people saying, scary. Um, So, you know, and then Jesus wraps it up. He says what he already said at the end of chapter 19. He says, so the last will be first and the first last. Again, this is not injustice, and it should not be a focus on false humility, as if we can make ourselves so last that we can be super first. Okay, it doesn't work like that. Listen, here's the punchline of this whole story. In my best interpretation as a Christian with the Holy Spirit teaching me the scripture and what I have at my disposal in terms of commentaries and other Christian men... And ladies, I don't think whether you're first or last is even relevant. I think it's Jesus saying we all get such amazing blessings from God and grace. Call yourself first. Call yourself last. It doesn't even matter. Right? Why even put yourself on a list? There's Christ and there's you, the believer. That's all you need to know. 
You diminish, he increases. He put himself below all of humanity, so you put yourself below him and your neighbors, and you're good to go. Whether you're last and first in God's kingdom, it's going to be a great day. Better than going to Disney World for the first time. Believe me, with inflation, I don't want to know. I'm just telling you guys, Jesus is the thing. We receive the same for the last or the first. It's meaningless where we're saved or where we rank in that hierarchy. Jesus just wants to demonstrate his goodness and generosity by saying this. His grace is more than you can fathom. So what are the big takeaways? This is, this is a heavy teaching, right? We could, we could have five sermons on this section and we could say an hour of different things and it would all be true, right? Maybe 25 years from now, I'll come back and I'll be way better at it. But here are three big takeaways I think we can, we can uh, have this morning. Number one, tickets for the entrance to the kingdom of heaven are given and cannot be bought. They're given and cannot be bought. Christ alone seeks us and invites us to enter his kingdom. Two, our reward is eternal life spent with Jesus. He is our prize. As workers in his kingdom, we should be totally satisfied with and in him. Our work is worship. We do not labor to earn more than has already been given. We already have more than we deserve. And three, we did not earn our place in the vineyard. Therefore, jealousy and resentment have no place. When we realize that everything is all about Jesus, we rejoice with the newly saved sinner. We celebrate other believers' successes in ministry. Because the truth is, it's really all of our success. Because we're one in Christ. We're a body. Seek to serve and exalt others like Jesus did for us. We can get to labor for the Lord. We get to labor for the Lord. Remember that the end of the day is coming. 6 p.m. is coming and there are a lot of people that haven't been hired yet. Have you went and told them about the landowner's invitation? Have you gone to tell them how they can be in God's kingdom so that when night falls... You are with Jesus in the renewal of all things. That's the question we have to ask. And that question is important because it it means that we have to understand ourselves and evaluate our hearts. Are we trying to earn God's favor? Are we trying to earn our own favor? Do we know Jesus the way Jesus wants us to know him? Have we put our full trust in him and not just trust that he's not going to crash our car or you know, let our bank account go to zero, but do we trust him with our very life, our eternal life? Jesus is God. Jesus is man. And Jesus didn't come just to have great stories in the Bible. He was the model man. Adam failed. Adam failed. Jesus succeeded. Jesus is the new Adam. He did everything perfect and everything right. And when he died that horrific death, it was in our place. He is the perfect sacrifice. Everything in scripture from Genesis 1 verse 1 to the end of Revelation points to Christ Jesus. Him crucified, him buried and raised again on the third day. And so how do we get into the vineyard? It's very simple. Turn from your sin and worshiping false idols. Whatever is more important to you than Jesus, throw it in the garbage. Run to the Savior and ask him to forgive you. You need a seed the size, or you, you need faith the size of a mustard seed. First John says that if you're faithful to confess your sins, Jesus is faithful to forgive you. Run to him. And when you do that, you will be what he says to Nicodemus in the, in the Gospel of John in chapter 3 born again. You will be a new creation. You will not be who you were. You will die to your old self like Christ died in the tomb. You will be a new person like Christ was glorified out of the tomb. You will now be an adopted child of God. Blameless and holy and righteous and earned. And you have, excuse me, you have not earned, but you have been given the reward that you couldn't earn before. Eternal life. But not because you are righteous. Not because you are perfect, but because Christ was all of those things. When you turn to Christ, he gives you his account and he takes yours. And we get his benefits while he took our punishment. That's how we enter the vineyard. 